Once upon a time, there stood a land united, filled with wonders and riches, sprawling with great cities that rivaled the works of some of the greatest architects in history, populated by peoples of different language, culture, and looks, ruled by kings of different realms and territories, but united by one name. This land was no ordinary empire, but the great Persian Empire. And above this massive kingdom, there stood only one, the King of Kings, the Shah An Shah of the Achaemenid Empire. So while I think that it would be pretty cool to make a video just about the famous emperors like Cyrus the Great or Darius the Great, this video will mainly focus on those that are often left out of the conversation, those that hold the entire empire together, the bureaucrats. Yeah, I know, you can barely hold in your excitement. But in all seriousness, the administration of the Achaemenid Empire, or the Persian Empire, is one of the most intricate things I've researched. Like, the Persian Empire lasted more than 200 years, even though it covered land all the way from Greece to northern India. Just to give you some perspective on how big this really is, the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan barely lasted 150 years, and it only fell because it collapsed in on itself, while the Achaemenid Empire was conquered by an outside force, the famous Alexander the Great. Psst, check out our old video on that. What? Who said that? Alright, so anyway. The way the Persian Empire kept this whole thing together was because of a weird blend of decentralization through centralization. Now I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but just let me explain it. In order to keep this massive empire from collapsing in on itself, there were three levels of administration. Central government, satrap, and local administration. The central government refers to the Shah, his court, and the military. The satrap refers to a specific region inside the empire and the local level of the government refers to the villages and the towns. To keep it simple, satrap was just another word for a governor. The Persian king would pick someone, usually a Persian or a high-ranking noble, and they would govern one of the 20 districts within the empire. The satrap would rule for the remainder of his life, unless he committed crimes like not pay taxes, rebel, or not pay taxes. So what were the duties of a satrap? He was basically a local king. He did everything a king would do, but just on a smaller scale. They would collect taxes and send to Persopolis, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. They would make sure that the agricultural economy was operating smoothly and properly, and they would keep peace and stability within their own regions. There's a few more, but that's the gist of it. And in return for doing all of this, the Satrap would possess an enormous amount of power within their regions, and they were the supreme authority of the land. Now, since some regions were so massive, the satrapy was further divided into sub-satrapies. These sub were usually run by the local ruler or leader of the place, as they knew the land and people better. Their duties were modeled after the satraps. They would pay taxes, don't rebel, and they would carry out justice. The tax collection was done by scribes, who would evaluate the land and deem the appropriate amount of taxes owed by the farmers. While the Persians did have coinage, they also paid in goods such as grains and cattle. The collectors would send this to the sub-satrap, who would send it to the satrap, who would send it to the shah. Thus, the empire was able to run smoothly with the local populace administrating their own lands while under the observation of the satrap. Okay, now let's pause for a moment. Do you see anything wrong with this seemingly perfect system? Let me give you a hint. Given enough time, the satrap would grow to be so powerful that they would either A, be able to challenge the shah directly and place themselves on the throne, or B, they could stage a rebellion and place a puppet emperor on the throne. Okay, that was a pretty big hint, my bad. Anyway, this becomes an even bigger problem when you think about how massive some of these territories were. I mean, just look at Egypt. This thing is huge. The Sarap could legit make a kingdom out of these territories and attempt to rival the Shah. In order to prevent this, the Shah had to think of a way to mediate this inherent tension present in the political and administrative system of Persia. Okay, now pay attention because this will be on the test. I mean, th this is where it gets interesting. I'm sorry, I just got a high school flashback. Alright, so moving on from my unfortunate past. In order to combat the potential power of the satrap, the Achaemenid Empire put together a few systemic checks to ensure the loyalty of the satraps. The first of which was to separate the administrative and military powers from the satrap. As mentioned before, the satrap was in charge of keeping the peace and ensuring that taxes were collected. However, the Shah was the one who picked the military heads. At first, this was done just to separate the civil sphere from the military sphere. But it also came in handy to ensure that the satrap would not have the ability to muster together a rebellion. This allowed for military loyalty to only the Shah. The fact that this mechanism was in place meant that the Shah and the central government realized the tremendous danger of having a vassal that could muster a private army. With the commander in place, 
the Shah at least had some sort of measure of circumvention against any ploy that the Satrap could think of. The second check that the Shah often deployed were called the Eyes of the Kings. Xenophon, in his book on the first Shah of the Achaemenid, stated that the announcements so often made, such as the king's son is coming down, or the king's brother, or the king's eye, refer to these inspectors. We'll refer to these roles as the king's eye, since that's the most common term used by historians, and because I think it sounds pretty cool. The king's eye would do annual inspections on the province of the Shah, and investigate the satrap to ensure all is well. If the satrap was unable to accomplish his duties, he would be removed from his office. This position of the king's eye wasn't given to just anyone, but it was instead a highly respected office that was given the full authority and prestige of the Shah. Now the last check that the king appointed was the royal scribe. The royal scribe's job would be to transcribe whatever the satrap required, though he would have other duties aside from this. According to historian Christopher Tolpin, in the case of the satrap's royal scribe, it seems reasonable to suppose that he is appointed by the king, and he could, therefore, be construed as, among other things, a royal spy upon satrapal loyalty. To simplify this, the royal scribe would be appointed by the shah as a sort of spy slash secretary, under the vice of being employed to the satrap as a loyal servant. This constant surveillance kept the satrap in check, or at the very least, forced the satrap to give the public impression of loyalty. This role was highly respected and was seen as the king's secretary. The authority on which he spoke was borrowed straight from the king, and therefore it was as if he spoke for the king on a certain matter in the satrap's court. Summing up these three methods, the ability to choose these roles in not only the shah's court but the satrap's court as well gave the king tremendous power in shaping the actions and policies of the satrap. Though the satrap system was one of decentralization, as it divided the empire into 20 districts and gave autonomy to the satrap to fulfill his assignments, these key positions allowed the satrap's policies to fall in line with the central government. And thus, centralization was achieved through decentralization. Ta-da! Now when we talk about the effectiveness of all this, it would all be rendered useless if it weren't for the empire's vast administrative infrastructure. The royal roads that were constructed by the Shah connected the entire empire. To illustrate just how massive these roads were, they linked modern-day Pakistan together with Egypt. Thus, the empire was connected all throughout, along with the added bonus of creating a communication system that was unrivaled in the ancient world. While the use of roads connected the empire, the Shah put even more infrastructure to ensure that the communication would be safe and secure for the messengers. To accomplish this goal, the Persians deployed a series of supply depots across the roads to ensure that the messengers had a place to stay while on their journeys, as well as to ensure that the roads were safe. The safeguarding of these supply depots was a constant expenditure to enforce the fact that the royal messengers would not and should not be hindered on their journey of delivering the king's message. This policy was so successful that even Herodotus, the father of history, praises the Persians on the speed of their communications by stating, nothing mortal travels so fast as these Persian messengers. Though this was done for the messengers, they weren't exactly what the king was trying to protect. Rather, it was the communication with key officials who were hundreds of miles away from the capital, as well as the king's eye, the royal scribe, and the military commander. In the end, the royal roads was just another tool that the Shah used to maintain central control over the districts. You could say this was another form of centralization through decentralization, as it was the royal, or central roads, that connected the decentralized and autonomous states and regions. Though the governmental policy was about maintaining control over the vast empire, the underlying goal of the Persian institution, in regards to decentralization, was to uphold a level of religious tolerance and freedom for its citizens. This level of religious freedom and tolerance in the Achaemenid Empire was unprecedented in the ancient world. This was due to a conscious effort to provide a level of security against persecution for religious and ethnic minorities in the empire. In fact, one of the most widely known rulers during this period of the empire, Cyrus the Great, is given high praise today due to his high regard for religious tolerance. This can be seen in the Cyrus Cylinder, regarded as the first human rights charter by the UN, where Cyrus the Great returned the Jews to Jerusalem, and used court money to rebuild them their temple. This story has been corroborated in the Hebrew Bible, where they recount the story of Cyrus returning them to their homeland. These two sources provide the narrative that Cyrus was an exceptionally kind ruler that allowed minorities to practice their faith and culture as long as they paid their taxes. This tolerance was no accident of the satrap system, but it appears that it was the intended purpose of the system all along. 
Cyrus and his successors were able to accomplish this goal by not only creating a culture that encouraged diversity and tolerance, but by also building it into the governmental structure of Persia. While it is true that the Sarab would often be of Persian nobility, those under him would be part of the local populace as mentioned before. This policy accomplishes the level of autonomy for the local population, giving them some form of independence and political freedom, while at the same time creating a highly functioning government. Therefore, not only was the practice of religious tolerance a morally correct policy according to modern society, but it was also a successful and effective governmental policy that made the process of governing much smoother. To sum it all up, the Persian Empire was huge, and the people that ran it were etched into the annals of history. But in the end, the people that kept this empire together were the bureaucrats. So while they seemed like they were just cogs in the machine, they weren't any less important than the Shahs or anyone else at the time. Also, none of these cogs were strangled to death for back in the Rong Dynasty, so maybe it is better to just be a cog in history. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you made it all the way to the end and you enjoyed it, leave a like and a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.